Hello and welcome to the Apologetics 315 podcast with your hosts Brian Auten and Chad Gross. Join us for conversations and interviews on the topics of apologetics, evangelism, and the Christian worldview. Let me guess. Gozer worshippers. Right. No studying. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm joined by Chad Gross, as always. How are you doing this week, Chad? I'm doing well. Um, this has been uh, a really fun adventure uh, doing this podcast. Uh, this is my first podcast. Um, I'm super excited to be doing it with you and so thankful that you invited me to do it with you. But um, man, as we've been doing these uh, interviews, it's it's been certainly um, uh, educational. It's been a lot of fun and uh, just learning a lot. Yeah, I, I always like the interviews because it's like uh front row seat to an education and it's uh feels like you're always learning because it's around 20 episodes in now we thought we would just kind of maybe reflect on some of the interviews and things that have come away with because for me i talk about getting an education doing this but at the same time things have changed me along the way you know uh things Mm -hmm. that uh, i came away with from different interviews or different conversations have made made a real difference uh, either the way i think about things or and my spiritual life and stuff like that. And then other things that just come away with nuggets like, oh man, that was amazing. So it would be great to have a look at some of these interviews and maybe chit chat through them. Yeah. So I wanted to share before we do that, <laughs> that one of the interesting things that I do is, is I, I was on a preaching team at one point and uh, one of the, uh, the pastor had left to go to another church and the church was kind of scrambling. So they assembled this team of people in the church and I was asked to be on it. So I would preach once a month. One of the things this guy recommended that I do is he said, you should go back and listen to your sermons. You know, it's, oh, man. You, you pick up things that you don't know you're doing and, and that you can improve on. And, and it's just very helpful. And so as soon as you, you know, you kind of having established this Apologetics 315 podcast in the past, I didn't want to come on and, and, you know, like ruin it or bring it down or something, honestly. So I thought, OK, I've got to start listening to these. And also, I love listening to how you edit in the clips and things. It just I'm sitting there. I'm usually doing something while I'm listening and I'm laughing out loud. But one of the I, I've picked up some things like some ticks that I have that I that I need to work on. Okay. So I just thought it'd be fun to share them. OK, so one okay, of them for it. is especially during the Hazen interview. Yeah. Oh my gosh, man. I sounded like the Joker. I was laughing like <laughs> constantly. And I mean, Craig is a very like fun, animated guy. And so I, I genuinely did find him humorous. But as I was going back and listening, it, it just seemed like he could say anything. And I would be like, ha 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 ha. <laughs> I'd be laughing. <laughs> and I almost was getting annoyed by me as I was listening to the interview. It's funny you say that because I was watching looking at the subscribers. And then, you know, we were up oh, there and, you know, the hundreds of thousands of subscribers and it just sudden <laughs> drop after that episode. I don't know. Maybe there's a connection. I don't blame them. And then the other thing is how often after I ask a question, I'll say, does that make sense? Does that make <laughs> sense? <laughs> and I thought, I really got to watch that. So. Th- those have just been a couple of things that have been funny for me yeah. to watch. So listeners, listeners, I'm working on it. I'm honing my craft. Hang in there. Uh, I'm trying to get better. By the grace of God, I'm trying to get better. I'm learning from the Master Otten here, so oh, I-, I should get better quickly. Okay, so. well, I'll draw attention to some of my faults so that people will hear them as, as I go along. One of the things I do is I will... I go back and I edit out ums and things like that from guests or us. Thankfully. Just thankfully. just to try to keep it clean for people and make it sound more intelligent. But one of the things I happen to do is I will blend my um into the question or the next word. So I'll say, so uh, could you, you know, and I'll, and I'll add the uh into the next word. So I can't edit it out. And it's so annoying. It's so annoying. <laughs> well, I, you know, now that you mentioned that, I have noticed that you do that, but I guess it's never stuck out as something that was distracting or annoying to me. You know, but yeah. I have noticed that you do that sometimes. But yeah, the, that is another thing when you're podcasting, isn't it? Worrying about the, uh, the amount of ums and you knows and, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's been, 
it's been interesting to go back and listen. And, and I think you and I have talked about this before. Listening to yourself sometimes can just be cringe inducing. Yep. Indeed it can. Well, yeah, let's let's look back. I'll, I'll talk about uh, our first interview was was Peter S. Williams. For me, this this was a great first uh, interview to, during the reboot, just because, as we've said, we, we just love him as a person and as a, as a thinker. All his writing is brilliant. So that was just a real treat. Just a great way to kick things off, I thought. Yeah, for me, coming into this and not having done a, an interview of this uh, capacity, it was really exciting to start with Peter S. Williams because I've been following his work and admiring his work for years. And so the idea that I was getting to interview him, I, I, as I told him before the interview actually started, I said, I'm going to try really hard to not come across like a fanboy. <laughs> and uh, I think I managed that. But yeah, I for me, what I took away from that interview is just uh, the reasonableness in which he responds to someone like Dawkins or someone of that mindset. And he does not allow himself to get wrapped up in the uh, rhetoric and, yeah. and to respond in like. And I also appreciated the reminder, uh, and I know this is getting ahead of ourselves, but the reminder that kind of David Baggett gave us as well is that uh, apologetics is both the true myth, you know, yeah, and that the importance of not only presenting apologetics not as a cold, these are the cold hard facts, you know, mm -hmm. but doing mm -hmm. it in a in a creative story, and that's what Williams did in that book, Outgrowing Dawkins, is. He, he reminds us the importance of putting our apologetic into a story that is both comprehensible, but interesting and, and engaging. And it showed me too. that book showed me that there's no one way that a, an apologetics book has to be written or there's a different ways you can present a dialogue. And I love how he just makes makes it real in that book when we talked about some of the characters struggling with depression and things like that. Like, OK, this is just being more real not trying you know you have mm. you're thinking all in line as much as you possibly can but you you don't try to present yourself as a person having all your ducks perfectly in a row you're completely owning and you know allowing for hey i'm i'm imperfect and i here are my struggles i, I like that i think I, that's something i saw there that i really appreciated yes all right so another interview we did was with Fuzz Rana, uh, thinking about evolution. So he's a biochemist. He talked about um, his book, Thinking About Evolution, what he was a contributor to. What are some of the things that stand out for you from that one? Well, first of all, it was just really, it was really neat to meet him. I mean, of course it was virtually, but to be able to meet him and, and talk with him, because again, I've been following his work for quite a while. I love his debate with Michael Ruse. Highly recommend people look that up on YouTube if you haven't listened to it. Uh, one of the things that was really memorable for me with the Fuzz Rana interview was how he was insistent that we engage with people that we disagree with, whether they be of young earth persuasion, whether it be theistic evolutionists, whether they be uh, naturalists. We engage with them on evidential grounds mm -hmm. and that we come at it with a respect, but also humility that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are these are some things that this is where I'm at right now, but I'm, of course, open to further evidence and that uh, we need to respect those who we disagree with. And I just love how he was his arguments were evidence based. His conclusions were modest. Uh, he wasn't trying to overwhelm us with, uh, you know, clear cut, definitive. This is the way and the only way. But it was like, here's where I'm at. I think the data supports it and I continue to sift through it. And I thought that was a, a good a good example. I, I think uh, RTB reasons to believe the organization he's with and he, he himself really models this um, idea of, well, here's our here's our model of um, how we see creation, um, the, the design of life, what how we are reconciling the data biblically and faithfully with the evidence, as you say. And then how do we be well informed about the latest science, the latest biochemistry, the latest biology, mm -hmm. what the arguments are from evolution, properly representing other arguments, not just like like dismissing them or mocking them or belittling them or straw manning them. Really, I think they just model that really well of of really being on the cutting edge of what 
and, and aware of what's going on in the biology today, in the cosmology as from their organization as a whole, but him from the biological standpoint, especially. It's really cool. And I loved what he was saying about like biomimicry and things like that, that are developments in science that are based upon discoveries about the design you see. So it's like, hey, we're we're going to imitate this structure that we see in uh, this such and such animal or a nano <laughs> machine you find in the cell because it's so efficient. You know, I, I love that because it's like, all right, whether or not you can make a convincing case to a skeptic that there's a designer, it's almost like, well, look, they're admitting the brilliance of what they see in nature. And how can that not be like a, a pointer one way or another to an intelligent design, you know? Yeah, yeah, that w that was very helpful and fascinating. And, and I also like what you're saying about the reasons to believe organization in the sense that they also um, not only want to interact and, and be up on the latest in science, but they also welcome critique and engagement. Uh, for example, they published a whole book with BioLogos, who is, mm -hmm. you know, the leading evolutionary creationist organization, debating and discussing the merits of old earth creationism versus the merits of theistic evolution or evolutionary creationism. And I just I think that if I were to start a ministry from the ground up, I would want to model it after something like they do. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think it's extremely helpful, organized and uh, very effective. Well, we had three uh, podcasts. We did um, sort of live questions and responding to with a live studio audience from Christchurch, Belfast. And that was really yes. cool. Testing the equipment, <laughs> giving the equipment a proper test and uh, also just seeing how what it was like uh, to have sort of a live audience asking or being, being able to give feedback. I kind of enjoyed that. Uh, I'm one of the ones I enjoyed the most was a question about personal prophecies. One of the questions was along the line of, hey, I'm hearing these prophecies that are or these words that are given as if they're from God. And, you know, how can these be tested? So, you know, we had a look uh, through Wayne Grudem's systematic theology in chapter 53, and we were defining prophecy, prophets, Old Testament versus New Testament prophecy. Uh, testing prophetic words and holding fast to what's good, not despising prophecies and stuff. So I, I enjoyed that because it was kind of a, not specifically apologetics, but it was along the lines of, you know, having a um, critical mindset, not critical in a negative way, but critical thinking when it comes to, okay, we want to welcome spiritual gifts, for instance, or and be faithful to the scripture, but we can't just like go so off on one side of the pendulum that you just accept everything because they say it's from God or, oh, God's speaking to me. So it was, to my mind, the right application of, you know, being like a Berean, testing everything and going back to the scriptures and saying, oh, how can we be true to um, the scripture? How can we be true to, how can we be a faithful steward of loving God with our minds, heart, soul, and spirit, you know, the, the whole package, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was interesting shortly after we recorded that podcast. I'm not even kidding. I'm talking within a week or two. I talked to two different Christians, two different settings. So it's not as if I was at a certain church that kind mm -hmm. of leaned toward these beliefs. These were two unconnected Christians. Both of them told me that they follow prophets and that these prophets were prophesying that Donald Trump was going to become president again during uh, not in 2024 but that that uh, I would we would not have to they would they weren't worried about president Biden being the president for too long this is their words because these prophets had said that Donald Trump is going to be back in office and of course I they could clearly tell that I was skeptical of mm -hmm. that and uh, didn't even understand how that could happen and basically the reply was, is, well, God can do what God wants. And it was just so interesting because it made me reflect mm. on our conversation, uh, yeah. you know, about kind of the boundaries that we should kind of adhere to and how we need to be wise about who we're listening to. And it needs to be consistent with scripture. It just brought all those things to the forefront. And uh, and so this is something that is, you know, I know that your uh, church from the UK had initially brought the question, but it's something that's very prevalent over here as well. Yeah. Right during that time, I saw a video on YouTube. Don't know how I got there. 
<laughs> I think I was trying to sure, look up something sure. on prophecy, <laughs> uh, but uh, it was Pat Robertson basically uh, prophesying that Donald Trump was going to be reelected. Now, I don't know how many people have been prophesying that, but again, back to some of the stuff we discussed, like, OK, or who are they accountable to when they don't get it right? Who's there to judge it when it's coming forth? Who are they? Right. What sort of local church body or whatever are they in fellowship with where there's elders or people that are above them to put these things in check or to say, yeah, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's from the Lord. Maybe you feel that, but we'll just kind of take that with a grain of salt and, you know, uh, what's going on? And And I don't see any big apology. Now, maybe there's some people that come back and say, oh, uh, <laughs> you didn't pray hard enough. You know, there's always a way out. Mm. Uh, well, so that's what is a um, point of interest for me that needs to be addressed, because I think it's just very much in error. There's something out of whack when there are leaders, quote unquote, leaders or leaders only in the sense that they have their own ministry with their name on it or something like that. But there's there's nobody with any spiritual uh, covering or authority, it seems, to sort of hold those people in check and say, hey, listen, you need to stop with this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah, how many people I, are they I leading think, astray because they're just a big voice or something like that? Yeah. And, and I think I think, too, the one of the things you said there, I agree completely that there's there's no accountability. But also, I think that a lot of these people and again, I don't we don't want to go too far down this trail. I understand. But <laughs> yeah. I think a lot a, a lot of these people we could do a whole podcast on this, maybe. But a lot of these people are preying on people because mm -hmm. a lot of these so-called prophecies are, in a sense, telling people exactly what they want to hear. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. And so you said a moment ago that that might be how you feel. And I think therein lies the problem. I think what it is, is these prophets are saying things that people want to be true. Yeah. And there's a whole pile of scripture uh, that basically talks about, I mean, maybe we should just be do a study about what false teachers look like because right. they, they look good. They, they tickle, tickle your the ears, ears. They tell you what yep. you want to hear. And I think for me, that's a that's a big part of it, because both of these people that I talk to, this is this is a case in point, and then we can move on if you want. Case in point is, is that they both were staunch Donald Trump supporters. And they both were very upset that Biden became president. President Biden was was in office. And so, of course, here's this prophet saying, oh, you don't have to worry. You know, he's not going to be in office very long and Donald Trump's going to be back in office. Well, of course, they want to latch on to that. And if you're not interpreting that through the lenses of, of what you're recommending and what you recommended in the podcast and also through um, good discernment, then mm -hmm. you're going to want if you're basing that, if you're solely basing your faith on your feelings, then you're going to latch to that. And these yeah. people come to you and they seem to have some kind of semblance of authority. Uh, but of course, we have to gauge their authority through the scripture not through mm -hmm. how they appear because obviously as yeah. you're pointing out appearances can be very deceiving and the scripture i mean what's yeah. that out? well and there are various degrees of trouble <laughs> but when someone says thus saith the lord and then they say what is going to happen they're making what as i see it a predictive prophecy that something is going to come to pass now when it does not come to pass and they haven't included some sort of conditional within their prophecy how are you not just blatantly the most obvious form of false prophet because your right. prophecy was false so you're disqualified i would say from going any further with that you need to be sat down or you need to come forward and say i got it wrong and i was telling you something on a national scale or not to mention someone could say something on a global scale at minimum it's highly reckless to, to not come and speak tentatively, you know, when, when you're going to say something like that. And, and like we said in that one podcast, when people say a word of prophecy, which is for an encouragement to the believers and things like that. OK, we're getting when we're splitting hair, we're <laughs> sort of making divisions between like prophecies of encouragement and edification, building up of the church, you know, maybe elaborating on a scripture and saying. 
here's what I feel the Lord kind of putting on my heart for you. Uh, take mm. it if it seems to apply. You know, that's a lot different than saying, thus say the Lord, this is going to happen. And you're putting yourself in the, in the role, sort of like an Old Testament prophet saying, you know, here, here comes this, get ready. Okay, let me just, what am I going to sell my house? And, you know, <laughs> it's like, how many people have written these books like uh, here, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988? Yeah. You know, oh, right. got it wrong at 92, uh, 97. Right. Like, all right. <laughs> I did. Your my math was wrong. <laughs> this is it's like the book deal that keeps on giving, you know? <laughs> well, I think that yeah. uh, I feel led that we should move on here. Right, so, right. No, I uh, maybe sound like I got a, like a bee in my bonnet, but this is why I think that there needs to be a balance between, yeah, let's embrace spiritual gifts. Cool. I'm all for that because I see people that are apologetics sort of types and they're just too, in my mind, too intellectual. Okay. Where are you? Have you prayed for the person? You know what I mean, there's like off in that side. And then there's people that are way off in there. That's like never even pick up a book about anything. That's not like, woo. So I'm like, Come on, let's combine them back to J.P. Moreland, our favorite guy. You know, right. love God with all your mind, love God with all your heart. Let's embrace spiritual gifts, but let's do it right. Let's properly divide the word of truth, that sort of thing. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to achieve or hope for or envision is that maybe even when we are doing the podcast, that's hopefully one of the goals that I'm trying to bring across is that, okay, uh, let's pray, you know, on the podcast. Let's talk about spiritual things. Let's talk about miracles and testimonies. Let's talk uh, also about philosophy. Let's talk about critical thinking, because all of these things, it would seem to me, would make you a formidable, well-rounded Christian thinker um, and witness. Yeah, fully orbed Christian. Right. Yeah, you like that word orbed. orbed. I do like that I'm gonna word I'm going to get you orbed. a shirt that says, Chad Gross, fully orbed. <laughs> <laughs> except i'm only part i'm only partially orbed but that's okay I, you know <laughs> all right in the next uh, interview david baggett yes I, I just love this guy you know how you just feel like you connect with someone like hey i really like this guy right that was just all over that interview not to say anything negative about the other ones but i, I just really feel like man he's just a brilliant person with a huge heart and uh, just a gentle, kind, caring attitude and everything. It was like, wow, uh, I love that interview and all about the moral argument. Yeah, yeah. He was he was very warm and you could tell that uh, this went far beyond academics uh, for him. This was a I, I love how one of the reasons he's so passionate about the moral argument is because it does directly relate to the gospel mm -hmm. and it directly relates to transformation. And you could tell that that was a big passion of his. And I think that just listening to that interview, it would be really difficult to come across or to cling to, I should say, that oft repeated claim of, oh, you know, we don't need to do apologetics. We just need to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. I think that what Baggett was able to do just in that short interview that we did with him was he was able to show that that one is indispensable to the other, but they're also complementary. Mm -hmm. and, and to do one without the other is to do both a disservice. Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was that was really, really um, helpful for me. And then also that idea of him bringing out was very refreshing of, of C.S. Lewis calling the story of Christianity the true myth. And what he meant by that, of course, is not that Christianity is a myth, but that it's true. It's it's based on facts, but it also tells this grand, beautiful story. And yeah. that if our apologetic is going to be potent, uh, the most potent apologetic, he even argued, he thinks, uh, is this apologetic that's weaved into story. And then I thought it was really neat how his wife is this uh, um, English professor. And of course, he's the philosophy guy. And so he was talking to us about how he can go to his wife and say, hey, I, I kind of need an illustration for this. Mm -hmm. And it might take her a little bit, but sooner or later she'll come and say, hey, how about this from this book? And he says it more often than not is better than any kind of al analogy or thought experiment he can come up with. Yeah. Well, what about that uh, uh, Center for Moral Apologetics that they're oh, doing yeah. at Houston Baptist University? That 
that made me want to like, hey, hey, honey, can can we maybe yeah. uh, relocate here? Uh, Where's I mean, my it's, stimulus it, check? It's spent. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, and I mean, and, and how about the fact that they're they're doing their program completely online now? Yeah. So uh, you can you can do it online. Of course, you know, you, know, you miss out on some benefits. But uh, yeah, it was just super interesting to. Um, uh, learn about that uh, Center for Moral Apologetics. I encourage people to check that out if they're interested in researching the moral argument and uh, knowing that kind of inside and out. And it sounds like, uh, you know, David Baggett is the person you want to you want to be yeah. studying under if you're interested in the moral argument. Yeah. Well, in episode 14, talk to the Belfast bigot from an undisclosed location in East Belfast. <laughs> it was the, it, it was from the bigot. Ca- it was from the bigot cave. <laughs> that's Re- right. remember that's yeah, right it was from the bigot kid <laughs> so what for listeners one of the things that was the best part if you haven't listened to this interview you've got to go back and listen to it because the best part is how often brian likes to say bigot you can just <laughs> tell he loves that word uh as as jest obviously if you listen to the interview you know that the belfast bigot is not a bigot it's um it's a play on words because whenever you take kind of a conservative stance uh you're often accused of being yeah. a bigot and so the idea behind that is he says okay go ahead and call me a bigot i'll be a bigot fine yeah. can we actually talk about the arguments now so i thought that was kind of a neat yeah. uh, rhetorical uh device yeah. you know in that way well you know the previous episode was david baggett and then in the, the belfast bigot so there was that i was trying <laughs> to get the guests together so that each one morphs into the next you know <laughs> uh, it failed after that um, a lot of the um Stuff we talked about around pro-life arguments, ob- objections to to the pro-life arguments and how to answer them. I, I just really liked how thorough he was and how thoughtful he was uh, about the subject, even though, you know, we, we've talked to the likes of Scott Klusendorf, who's like, he does that for a living. But, you know, mm-hmm. I would feel comfortable getting this um, married guy who works a, a job uh, local to me. He could you know, stand his ground and argue for a pro-life position and answer all kinds of these common objections to to that position and uh, doing it in a winsome way, not in a bigoted way. And, you know, he's making he's making an imprint uh, in his locale. He's doing it online. He's reaching out across the waters. And it's like, I love to see here's a perfect what we're trying to do with part of the podcast is like, present examples of, hey, here's people that are pretty much in the same situation as you, dear listener. And look, they're doing something with what they know. And that was like, oh, let's get him on because this is an example of someone who's not a professional apologist, who's making a difference as a lay apologist, if you want to call it that. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was a good takeaway for me as well, is, is the impact he was making from that kind of lay apologist uh, position. The next uh, one, one I wanted to talk about was the um, are signs of a coming revival episode. The reason I want to right. talk about that one is not just because you got a good fruit basket out of it. Um, I did is, indeed. Yeah, it was a uh, one of the great. <laughs> I'm gonna miss it. <laughs> one of the great questions that came in, talking about are there signs of a coming revival and etc. So we did we did talk about the topic of revival, and it was really enjoyable for me to delve into that topic for a while in preparation for that that um, episode. And in doing that, you can't not ask yourself, mm, am I uh, in revival or not? Am I walking in a personal revival? So it actually was a spark to ignite certain things that had been dormant in me, certain areas of my prayer life that were waning or had been like coals that needed to be stirred up again, certain aspects of maybe self inter- or like introspection about how am I pursuing God? Am I chasing after God? Or am I just kind of drifting along, floating down the river, <laughs> you know? So from that aspect, that's an example of one of these, in, uh, inter- not interviews, but podcast episodes we've done. And it's like, wow, I got so much out of doing that one. And then going back and actually listening to it. And we've talked about this before, Chad, where it's like, we're recording the episode, but then we actually go back and listen to it and like, wow, I got so much out of that. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that was... It was amazing. I, I kind of enjoyed yeah. that aspect of it. Yeah, it's kind of scary how I can listen to you talk and I can also listen to people that we interview talk. 
But then when I go back and, and I hear things and I'm like, oh, wow, that was weird. I was doing the interview and I literally didn't pick that up the first time. <laughs> and I don't know how that happened. That's where was I when that happened, you know? But yeah. uh, no, I, I appreciated that a lot, uh, the revival uh, topic. And it really helped me kind of, it also um, awoke in me kind of a desire to uh, kind of self-evaluate and to say, where am I at with the Lord? you know, why am I not praying for uh, personal revival? And uh, why am I not praying for revival where I work or revival in, in you know, my church? And uh, so it, it was super helpful. But I also just appreciated how we were able to look at, are there signs of a coming revival? And I thought the way that you answered that for me is exactly how I would answer it if somebody asked me now, which I wouldn't have before the podcast. But when basically the the question being is is there signs of a coming revival the answer is well i i can't say that but there are certainly signs that we need a revival and i thought that was expe- that was super helpful for me personally mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah I, it was highly enjoyable and then someone did send you a nice fruit basket um oh right. man yeah. Yeah. which which i mean i don't know how long we ate stuff out of that fruit basket <laughs> it was so good it had the best pears ever Oh, huh. huh? Man, they were so good. Anyway, huh. sorry. One fruit I, I was, that I, I just was... don't get into pears. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. wow. Just not a pear guy. Um, right, Craig Hazen well, we interviewed. Aren't, aren't we a pear? <laughs> <laughs> Hardy her. <laughs> <laughs> so Craig Hazen, I'm glad you're laughing because we're going to talk about Craig Hazen. And, oh, great. Uh, <laughs> no, you know, I love about Craig Hazen is this like. He's so dynamic and uh, so uh, just get you fired about it, up about everything. But here's what here's see, like there was a bunch of dominoes that fell uh, for something that kind of like helped me along spiritually. The first was maybe prior to the revival one or the revival episode was a, a domino. Another next domino was this one with Hazen where he's talking about and we were talking all about their apologetics program. But he also, we started asking him about his book on prayer, um, mm-hmm. you know, asking God and praying like dangerous prayers, that sort of kind of a thing. So I downloaded the book after the fact, and he didn't send me a signed copy, even though I prayed he would. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know how you get a signed Kindle version, but anyway. Yeah, really? Electronic signature? Yeah. I, reading that prayer book was like, oh, Yeah right on top of this revival thing and uh you know kind of stoking my faith about praying and like why don't i pray about this why don't i pray about that or why did i stop praying about this you know and that was really helpful and um so i came away from that episode even though we were talking about apologetics programs at biola was like oh because we did that i prayed more my prayer life changed and was different i was really grateful for that so yeah, and I think the thing that I've not only got out of our interview with Hazen, but also just in the past of listening to lectures and his works is that he he really is good at telling little anecdotes that uh, go with what he's saying, and it makes them very memorable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's something that I would want to model. Like, I feel like if you were in a conversation with Hazen and you asked him about the uh, cosmological argument or the resurrection of Jesus or something. I'm I can't imagine him, you know, just launching into the premises. I I think that he would have a little anecdote or let me tell you a story or let me tell you about Mm -hmm. this one time I was at a conference or something. And uh, for me, I listened to him at a conference in Mount Airy years ago. I mean, I don't know how many years ago it was. And there were there are still there are stories that he told in that in those lectures that he did. I think there's one or two of them over a series of days that I still remember. And it was just because of how well he told the story. And so it was just a good lesson for me. I mean, Jesus taught through parables. That's not exactly, of course, what Hazen does, but he uses these stories as kind of add ons to what he's saying. And it just makes Mm -hmm. it very easy to listen to him. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's funny. (laughs) Yes. Here's another interview we did with another anonymous Batman in his Batcave, apologetics cave. Uh, with wintry night so that if you're listening, this is episode 16 that uh, we're referring to. Christianity in the public square with wintry night. Um, he's been around mm-hmm. blogging for a long time. I, I love that interview. It was so much uh, about relevance to things that are happening today, things in policy, that sort of thing. But 
tell me what you thought and then I'll tell you about another domino from that one. Yeah. For me, I think what I took away from that was, yes, the importance of presenting yourself as an informed Christian, the importance of being informed on public policy and how being informed in public policy and what happens in Washington, for example, here in the States, um, directly affects how you can live your life and, and how free you can be a Christian, in a sense. Uh, and the, your, it, it impacts your ability to evangelize, to worship. Uh, to to uh, give and those things, but also I love that illustration that he gave, and he, and he used a film to do it. But he essentially said that y- as an apologist, you are defending someone who died for you, and that how when you think about that and reflect on that, how that should be what your life is focused on. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that was just the way that he worded that was a really good reminder for me. Uh, yeah. And simplified things in a really good way. I've since been in contact with him and just saying, hey, man, I got so much out of that interview that wasn't directly related to it. And for me, it was gleaning a few ways that he looks at his Christian walk. In the interview, he says, my money is, I'm doing fine financially. He something, said something along that line. And, he's, and he says, uh, but my money is not for consumer goods and Christian's money is not for consumer goods. It's for partnering, partnering for people with people for the gospel's sake. Mm. That, uh, it, that led me to go back and look at my charitable giving. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I thought, okay, uh, if, if I say, if I do a core values exercise and I say, what are my core values? And then that's great. Um, that, you know, can create a mission statement for your life or something. But then, um, you may say, okay, here are my core values. And then now what are my actions? And there's a gap there. So there are certain areas where I notice gaps between what I would affirm to be my core values. And that would be one of them, uh, that affected me. I'm like, oh, there's a gap there. So I had to look at my, my giving in that sense. It was a challenge there. And then it kind of, that was like a, a domino for me in my spiritual walk because it was like, it knocked over and, and then I, I thought, you know, he's talking in such a way where like my life's not my own. So I read some scriptures and came across this, um, you know, idea of a uh, servant in the scriptures and how Paul constantly says he's a servant of Christ Jesus. But if you look up the wording that it, it's, it says he's a slave. And so I happened to come across this book by John MacArthur that was really, really awesome. It's called Slave. <laughs> um, and it's, yeah, it's like a little book. I don't know. It, it didn't weigh anything. It's a Kindle <laughs> version. Oh, OK. OK. <laughs> See, oh, I forgot I you're a Kindle guy. I know. Yeah. Sorry. Um, it's OK. If anybody wants to send me books, they can send them to me in <laughs> Kindle uh, <laughs> gift card or something. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Um right. So this book, um, Slave by John MacArthur is amazing because it's like it, it talks about how, you know, that when they've translated that, they're basically kind of being kind and saying using servant instead. But we talked about all about slavery, what it actually looked like in those in that time frame and not to be confused in what it looked like during slavery in the States or the slave trade in more recent times. So but it talked about how who you belong to you belong to Christ that you're his servant you you don't have your own rights anymore um but you you were a slave to sin but now you're a slave to Christ and um now there's a lot more to it you know i don't want to like lead the reader astray by only giving a partial bit of it so i won't i won't <laughs> do that but uh just reading that was really um helpful from a spiritual point of view and a standpoint. And so wintery night, if you're listening, thanks for coming on that. And then that interview, because, uh, you know, I think he modeled something that in a certain way that helped me kind of go down a more positive track in that regard. So that was awesome. I thought his views on, and be on how to be informed about uh, what's going on locally and how to be how important our freedoms are, was really important to, and how to be equipped to do apologetics that was really helpful. Oh, no, I, I agree. I agree. So the next one that came along was our interview with uh, Jacob Varkis 
from India and his work with Saft Apologetics. What were your thoughts on that one? Well, first of all, I think that Saft is a great example of someone who of of just regular guys who came together, not a whole lot of background knowledge as to have how to have an apologetics ministry uh, and how God can just use still today. Uh, people who are coming to him and simply saying, Lord, do what you will with us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just been it was amazing to learn about how their podcast has grown to interviewing some of the top people in Christian apologetics and Christian thought, how they uh, had this uh, apologetics conference that was one of possibly the first apologetic international apologetics conference ever done uh, in India how they were able to get these worship leaders. Uh, I know that he mentioned that one of those worship leaders was kind of the uh, India, India equivalent of Chris Tomlin. And um, I just thought it was really encouraging to listen to uh, what God can do with just faithful people. I also appreciated uh, just hearing about kind of the spiritual landscape over in India, how it differs a little bit here in the States and some of the challenges they're facing. I thought it was fascinating that there is such a strong atheist presence over there mm -hmm. and yeah, they that do. they're kind of along, they're kind of along the vein of the new atheists, which we're kind of over here in the States, kind of post new atheist, at least at the academic level, unfortunately, the internet level, that's still very persuasive, uh, pervasive, but it was very interesting to hear how people are willing to translate atheistic works into languages over there that people can benefit from reading and how they even have atheist conferences over there uh, that are working toward refuting things like the cosmological argu argument, et cetera. So I'm just really thankful for ministries like SAFT. And, the, and it kind of brings back, in my mind, the urgency in the sense of, you know, we need apologetics. You know, we, we need this. It's a, yes. it's a really important tool. And uh, for me, sometimes I kind of like, oh, I'm familiar with that. I'm familiar with this argument and that. And you kind of know the landscape and then you, you're woke up and reminded again, like, whoa, this is really important. Not just really interesting. Mm. Uh, it's yes. really important. Um, and there it could be maybe the pitfall I'd fall into or maybe some other apologists could fall into or those who are into it is just like just get into it and it, well, just go down the rabbit hole because it's just so amazing and interesting. And. Yeah, it bolsters my faith and that sort of thing. But yeah, you can also dry up by just consuming, becoming an apologetics junkie. Uh, that's why I don't want this podcast just to be, no, we have to talk about apologetics all the time. No, we talk about how apologetics integrates within our Christian life and witness and that sort of a thing. Right. And, but um, yeah, it, when you talk about atheism in India, I'm like, geez, you didn't, you didn't think it was going to spread there, you know? Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah. Well, another one we want to talk about, we're coming up on the more recent interviews, but Sarah Enterline on her book about the life of Susanna Newcomb. That was a real gem, that book and the interview to follow up, because it was just, I didn't know what I was going to expect reading this book. It, and it was like, wow, what an awesome book. <laughs> you know what I mean? It, it, yeah, yeah. I, I think I mentioned to her in the interview that a lot of times when you get an apologetics book and you're reading it to prepare for an interview, a lot of apologetics, just because by nature, it covers similar content, you know? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it covers similar ground. And so when I got the book, you know, no apologies, the life and works of Susanna Newcomb, I was just expecting uh, more of the same, but, but of course written thoughtfully and things. And man, what a, what a surprise uh, to read about the brilliance of Newcomb, to see the originality of her work, to see the depth of her work, and the, the fact that she uh, just so unapologetically, not to be no pun intended, gave this robust case for the Christian faith, and also talked about how it, you know, what the consequences of this being true were, and how these Christian truths should impact our lives and how what they should mean for how we relate to God. And she was another example, going back to David Baggett, she was another example, Susan Newcomb, of seeing how these arguments and evidences directly impact the gospel and also how we live our lives, that they shouldn't be separate, that they should mm -hmm. be cohesive and working kind of symbiotic with one another. 
And so, yeah, that was just such a, that book was such a delight and a, and a nice surprise. I actually went out of my way to uh, recommend it on Facebook just because yeah. uh, it was such, as you said, I think it's a good word. I think it was a gem of a book. I haven't read another one like it. And as I told you after we, after, before we interviewed her, it's one that I want to go back and revisit and, and kind of unpack it more. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a beautiful, uh, beautifully designed, put together book as well. And a really good, like some, one that you can study, you know? Yes. This is all the footnotes and then you've got uh, the original and then the sort of a translated version. Really awesome. Yeah. So I love that Sarah Enterline interview. Top notch stuff. And we're coming up in our most recent interview uh, last week was with Eric Manning of the YouTube channel Testify. And again, another one of those interviews where I just really enjoyed talking to Eric, getting to know him, seeing that he's a dude with five kids, but he's taking the time being led to the Lord using what he knows and he's creating awesome content like amazing channel and he's cranking out videos like every week i don't know like one or two a week just really encouraging and this is the area of apologetics that really interests him and so he's using it yeah i uh, once again i was encouraged just to see somebody who uh you know he went to bible college but he admittedly said during the interview that apologetics was something that he personally got interested in when he started getting questions he couldn't answer and so he went after those, uh, began to get answers to those questions. And then he began writing himself uh, on a blog. And then those those blog posts eventually turned into videos. And these videos are so helpful. They're great for online evangelism, you know, responding to popular kind of things that atheists say. But uh, yeah, it was it was very encouraging. And it just goes to show you that, you know, if you put a little effort into it, we have uh, we have the tools and uh, you can work at it. And um, we have tools like a video scribe that he, he talked about in that interview, and, and it's very user friendly. And so somebody who's not inclined to do something like a podcast or uh, do writing, you can do something like that. So there's just so many ways to to do apologetics nowadays and to learn apologetics. And uh, I think these interviews have really shown me that uh, mm -hmm. um, that there are so many avenues and venues in which to get this information and be able to synthesize it and think about it. Well, there are more interviews ahead. One's, one that we've been looking forward to for a long time and a few other ones that are down the pike. Um, now, dear listener, we want to hear from you. What have you enjoyed about the interviews? What have you not enjoyed about them? Do you want to hear more about me and Chad talking or less? So we want to hear your feedback about the podcast. So you can email us at podcast at apologetics315.com. And here's the other thing we need to talk about, Chad. We're running out of Ghostbusters quotes, and at some point, there you know, there's no actual infinite uh, Ghostbusters quotes. Right. So, um, right. so I am proposing we open up, open up to another highly quotable, highly quotable movie. Also, an I know 80s where you're classic, going with this. Also, an 80s classic. Now, the Ghostbusters had lots of awesome quotes, and you can pick them out and stick them anywhere, and they're awesome. But exactly. And, and it had like uh, three or four people who were like comedians and they're all funny guys and they're interacting. Well, what if there was another movie? There was an 80s movie that had three really popular, great comedians and they all got together. And then there was like all these great quotes that you could just mine as a resource. Wouldn't that be great? That would be. That would be. I wonder what movie that would be. Three Amigos. Oh, yeah. Three amigos. Yes, there, yes. there are so many uh, amazing quotes. We're just taking the best stuff for our listeners. <laughs> just the best stuff. We don't need these newfangled memes that are going to go away to, you know, in the week. No one will know what this exactly. meme is. Exactly. We're, we're exactly. quoting the classics. The classics. Only the classics. So Tell uh, us we will die like dogs. <laughs> yes. Also, for the listeners, they should know that I have actually used a couple of Ghostbusters quotes already. The part about, oh, I think it's a mail plane. So during yes. a couple of our listener questions, I played that uh, clip before the, the question. Yes. So I'm just going to let you know that um, when I start running out of Ghostbusters quotes, I'm going to be weaving. Well, I'm not going right. to eliminate the Ghostbusters quotes. We will use them. No, we can never faithfully. do that. We'll use them yes. faithfully, faithfully, but we will. That's our primary source material right there. Yes. Well, we're yes. opening up the canon to include yes. other credible sources right. 
And we're um, also having a board meeting to discuss whether or not we can use Ghostbuster two quotes. Where we, you know, <laughs> Brian's yes. Brian's a little on the fence about it, but uh, I'm all for it because although it is an inherently flawed film, it's apocryphal. <laughs> but <laughs> but it still has some great quotes. Yeah. Um, Thank you for joining us for the podcast this week. That's all we have for you. Look forward to another interview in the coming weeks. And if you have any recommendations for people you'd like us to contact for interviews or topics you'd like to discuss, be sure to email us at podcast at apologetics315.com. Where can they find your stuff on your blog, Chad? Um, well, actually, because I've been working, focusing on the podcast lately, I haven't blogged as much, but there's a lot of materials and resources on Truth Bomb Apologetics, www.truthbomb.blogspot.com. Excellent. All right. See you next time. Later. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you have a question you'd like us to address or just a message for us, feedback, good or bad, you can either email us at podcast at apologetics315.com or leave a voice message for us using SpeakPipe. Just go to speakpipe.com slash apologetics315 to leave us a message. And remember, if you include a Ghostbusters quote in your question, we guarantee that we'll read it on the podcast we also ensure up to 50% better quality answers. Also, if you've enjoyed today's podcast, please leave a review in iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice. And please share this episode with a friend if you found it useful. Remember, you can find lots of apologetics resources at apologetics315.com, along with show notes for today's episode. Find Chad's apologetics stuff over at Truthbomb Apologetics. That's truthbomb.blogspot.com. This has been Brian Auten and Chad Gross for the Apologetics 315 podcast, and thanks for listening. Frostbank won't charge fees on overdrafts $100 or less based on qualifying conditions. That means no fees on accidental overdrafts, emergency overdrafts, or even when you sign up for a free audio streaming trial to listen to more than the same eight CDs you've had in your sedan since 03, but then you never use it because, hey, they're eight great CDs, and completely forget to cancel the trial until it bills you for a full year overdrafts. None of us is perfect, which is why Frost is introducing $100 overdraft grace if you meet qualifying conditions. Learn more at frostbank.com slash overdraft. Frostbank won't charge fees on overdrafts $100 or less based on qualifying conditions. That means no fees on accidental overdrafts, emergency overdrafts, or even when you sign up for a free audio streaming trial to listen to more than the same eight CDs you've had in your sedan since 03, but then you never use it because, hey, they're eight great CDs, and completely forget to cancel the trial until it bills you for a full year. Overdrafts. None of us is perfect, which is why Frost is introducing $100 overdraft grace if you meet qualifying conditions. Learn more at frostbank.com overdraft.